we were talking about how long it takes a company to change when they want. Let's say they have this infrastructure and they want to change to a different model. They have to let go of people. They have to retrain. And then when you actually get there, usually you don't end up where you thought you were going to end up from a quality or results standpoint. Um, and there was a there's a book that I'm really uh, really passionate about by Tom Goodwin, which is the the thesis is that like company if you build something new, you actually have to rebuild it. And so companies have the analogy uses is that the the company has built a ten story building for their office, but once they outgrow the space, then they put like a trailer in the parking lot, and then they build like a little another area outside mm -hmm. instead of and at some point those little extensions don't work anymore and at some point you actually just need to knock over the building and build the 25 story building that propels you to growth yeah um, I think companies run into that a lot so let's um let's get this started at um, at the SDR role and so there's been a lot of talk about and I've just like <laughs> I've seen this at so many companies where like the model that was built in the early 2000s of having people that were appointment setters to pass to closers, and it has evolved to some extent, but it's kind of like the building, yeah. right? They've kind of just like taken a building and added extensions on it. And so where do you, like, what are your thoughts on that right now and where do you see it going? Yeah, I mean, the SDR role is a really frustrating place to, to be in, right? Because we built it out as a way to separate, you know, the, the open, the, the conversational opening piece and to remove that repetitive task from the account executive and make them more efficient. The problem was we turned our focus from being uh, a much broader uh, thought around how we engage our clients and looking at their business needs, et cetera, to being much more about a checklist. So everybody falls within a mold uh, there's all these different acronyms and whatnot that we follow that create a, a behavioral set that we need to match within. But realistically, what we want to focus on is driving back quality into those calls and making people more uh, thoughtful and powerful when they go out and talk to clients. Today's SDR role, in my opinion, is broken because of the, the, the predictable qualification call that everybody knows at this point. We all know inside that we need to be more... Um, thoughtful about how we talk to our clients, but we're still being really prescriptive where we go out and tell them, hey, here's the product that we have. Let's pull everything down that you need from a literal standpoint and then compare products apple to apples. When really, we need to be more thoughtful about pushing our product in to solve a problem. We talk about it, but we don't really do it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the modern discovery call that everyone's aware of is much more customer focused and we all talk about doing it but we don't because we still need to qualify and build out that lead engine. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, it looks like we've built this really thoughtful program but we're still characterizing and qualifying people based on these behaviors that are list driven mm -hmm. and insular and not being more external and focused on how we can assist. Um, Really, if it were up to me, I'd either scrap the role or rebuild how it's built. Mm -hmm. um, I think given that we've shifted back into this more consultative selling role, we're really acting as partners and consultants. The SDR role in its current form is counterintuitive. It creates a behavior that basically says, hey, I need you to fit into my mold. Um, which drives people away because it's product focused. And in today's environment, selling product, everything's a commodity. You sell a product, now you're basically fighting price and features. Uh, as opposed to being more um, supportive in which we're trying to actually solve a problem in which price or those features may not matter. Mm -hmm. And where the actual price model breaks down because then you can compare how much are we actually helping and saving you in the long run. And so I've... Uh... It's interesting because when that model, the SDRA split was built, it was built purely to make the business's selling model cheaper and more efficient, was absolutely in no way driven by what the customer needed. Right. Entirely not. And it's got, I believe that it's gotten worse over time. It's interesting for me coming into as a, as a product manager, brand manager, demand gen, and now like kind of entering the, the sales world to look at it from an outside lens 
and be like, how, like, why are we doing a qualification call before we do a discovery call? Right. I, do, I really don't understand this, but the reason is because the roles are split. And so the roles are split. The SDR has to do this checklist in order to pass the person to the AE. And then the AE doesn't even do the discovery call. I've been on enough SaaS, uh, in enough SaaS sales process to know the discovery call never happens. Mm -hmm. The qualification, they jam you into a demo. There's no pain. There's no ROI financial argument. There's no discovery of what the buyer actually needs, and they just jam you through. And so I really do believe that because the roles are split, it's been, it's been focused on the company, not the buyer the let's get more into discovery because I think that's something that we both agree on and also the point at which it should happen. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that, I mean, for me, and I, we actually had like a long debate. I, someone called it an argument. I thought it was more of a debate last night on LinkedIn with a, with a VP of sales about the fact that if somebody comes in to your website, they match your ICP. It's a, you know, it's a CMO at a company that's 200 people and they filled out a form saying, I want a consultation, mm -hmm. like they're coming to me. They're not going to an SDR for a qualification call, but SaaS companies don't do that. Right. And so like I assume based on all of that criteria that they are qualif indeed qualified, right? If it's the same person as an office manager, I might not take the call. And so, and then we come in and the first thing that we do is 30 minutes of discovery. I don't have a demo to show. I need to find out what's going on. And mm -hmm. so, um, and so talk to me a little bit, I mean, I just kind of spewed out our, our process, but talk to me a little bit about how you think about that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you bring this up, right? Because I think we try and jam everybody into one, basically into, the, into one bucket. You know, oh, you came in, you're inbound, this is your path. Um, but if Disney called in, and I put Disney as a, you know, a, a one-off prospect and threw them in a bucket, I get fired. <laughs> I mean, I think we don't do a good enough job of looking at the inbound funnel and really breaking out within that funnel who goes where and who, who tackles what. Mm -hmm. uh, and to your point, I, I absolutely agree. The discovery process doesn't tend to happen because we assume that if it's inbound, they're already interested and they're on board and they figured out how much we cost somewhere. But we're doing ourselves again a disservice. We don't know their motivation. Mm -hmm. We don't know what they're using it for. We don't know what their plans are. The less, and, and my argument becomes the less knowledge we have, the less engaged and enabled we are to actually direct someone in the right direction. Maybe they need a lot more than what we're thinking about. Maybe in order to make us work, they need a partner and we can take a cut off of that sale as well. Maybe they don't need us and we can point them in the right direction and then when they're ready, they come back. We don't know. But in order to kind of create that proper pathway for a client to go through and make sure that they're engaged properly, we have to invest the time. But that's the problem. You know, it's our one non-renewable resource time. And because sales leaders are so focused right now on revenue, 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 especially from a funding standpoint, you don't really get the chance to backtrack and then look at you know, the overall strategy and process you're taking because investors want results today. Mm -hmm. So if we can show, you know, with an SDR role that we had this many calls, we converted this many, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and utilize those metrics, we set ourselves up to at least be able to give an answer as to why and not lose our jobs. But my argument is that two things are happening. One, we're not really looking at, particularly in growth firms, the quality of our sales leaders. Because we've all seen that as you grow, your skill set changes and the behaviors required of a VP of sales totally transforms the bigger you get. You, know, you stack people below you, managers come in, your responsibilities change and we don't think about what that flow looks like as we get bigger. SDRs may make sense in a small company where you can only hire three people and you have to be able to scale to, to handle to a small degree and adding two people doubles your team. On the other hand, those behaviors are totally different when you're managing a team of 50 versus 5,000 versus 10,000 if you're a big enough firm. So changing those behaviors um, based around what those calls look like and based on the role that you're in is critical. And I'd argue that it just starts from the top down. They don't actually know what we're running after. Mm -hmm. And because they're required, or not required, because they have to operate using external funds, mm -hmm. 
they're kind of pigeonholed into, into what they have to report out and what they have to show. And the result is that without your senior most leadership saying, let's try the strategy, it's not going to happen. And that only happens at, at the enterprise level, mm -hmm. where they have that ability, but now they're beholden internally. And, and up, to, up to this point in my career, I've gotten to where I am by not doing the things that the, everyone does. Right, and so I would really challenge sales leaders to take a deep look at that idea. Mm -hmm. um, people told me to do trade shows, to do sales enablement, to um, to run banner ads. If you look at all the stuff that's done in marketing, like people are all the way over here, I'm actually doing something completely different, sure, which has transformed my career and my the business that I'm running. But if you look at a, at a software company right now, they all, from a sales standpoint, they all run the exact same play. They do not challenge any of the thinking of how it's done. We will build this SDR engine. This is exactly how they're going to be measured. We're going to have these AEs, blah, 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 blah. We're going to have this success. This is the model. No, nothing's challenged. It's actually, I, I, I am, I, I'm borderline concerned at how, how low the level of challenging that thinking is right now. <laughs> um, and so if you look at what could be different about this, so we, we kind of get back to the talk, people think that the role of the SDR needs to change or the mm -hmm. type of SDR or the who they are, all these different things, how much they're compensated. I think that's one way to look at the issue. I think, that it, I think there's another way to look at it, which you might be actually solving the wrong problem, mm -hmm. right? And so if you look at these, the SDRs, okay, we need to change what, who they are, okay? So instead of having these people that are young, paid less, and are moved, trying to get out of the role in six months because the role sucks from what you do standpoint, how you're measured and how inefficient and ineffective it is, they need to get out. So we need to be able to have them in the role for two years. They need to be able to make a, over 100K. This is what people are saying. They need to have these types of skills. The activities that they're doing, I haven't heard anyone challenge what they do um, I would argue that they could be doing things a lot differently and get better results. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way to look at it. That's how people are pushing it right now. I would argue that if you had, if you got to that point where your SDRs are making 100, 120K and are staying in the role for two years and have more experience and are probably hopefully doing things a different way to get business, then you may as well just look at a full funnel account executive model. I really do think that that's where we should be end, ending up. For, and this is not a blanket statement. Companies should assess what is right for them. But I think a lot of companies would benefit from at least considering this idea, right? And so let's pretend that you don't have so many um, demos coming through from SDRs that are closing at a very low rate. So your AEs actually have more time. Mm -hmm. So if, that, if that's there, then the AEs actually start doing personal branding, thought leadership, content marketing, other things on LinkedIn. They start to actually build a brand. You change the way that you're doing marketing, so you're not jamming a ton of MQLs in that don't close. Your marketing's focused on driving revenue, so you actually have inbound leads that close at a higher rate coming into your AEs. You don't need the top of the funnel work from SDRs, and then you have solid AEs. They're making more money. Mm -hmm. You have less of them. They're more efficient. Um, I do think that that is a really feasible conversation for a company to have if they want to change in a time period of somewhere between 12 and 24 months. I do think that many companies between that are less than 50 reps could make that change in less than two years mm -hmm. if they were committed to the process. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think something has happened to the AE role as SDRs, as, as the program has built itself up and up. We've gotten lazy. You know, like we don't want to prospect anymore. We're basically trying to blame SDRs for not getting the leads in and then hold them accountable for the leads not being good enough because they have to work quadruple time. Um, so I'd argue that my, let me, let me talk through what my ideal yeah. sales team might look like or my ideal setup might look like, right? Number one, we're building marketing wrong. I, I agree with you. Marketing is looked at as this data-driven kind of like team where we basically dump money in and leads come out based on digital or print interactions and occasionally trade shows and what have you. We need to own our personal brand. And we also need to own as salespeople our company brand. Frankly, if it were up to me, 
we would have that owned across an org, right? Every single person in an org would be responsible for developing their brand and helping develop the company brand. Tools Talent like, leaders. Absolutely. Hiring managers. Everyone's so, selling. Yes. Everybody. Engineering whether is it's selling. The, whether it's the company, you're selling the company as a place to work, right. a product to buy, anything. Absolutely. Even engineering is selling You know what they're doing when they go out and talk to people at trip. We're all selling. Yep. So we have to manage our personal brand on, on through a combination of, of areas, both how you put yourself out in the world and frankly, let's make it scalable and put it on a tool like LinkedIn, mm -hmm. right? Like you can create and nurture your company brand through your own employees with a little bit of thought. Uh, and a program that takes effort. Mm -hmm. But that comes out of marketing uh, beyond product marketing. This is much more brand focused and personal development mm -hmm. focused. So management has to be involved, direct line managers are involved, marketing sets the process of what it should look like, we build it out and we own it. Mm -hmm. um, thought leadership is a part of marketing, uh, posts are a part of marketing, personal, all of this mm -hmm. is important because it develops a funnel in, and we talked about this earlier, but I mean, just stand back and look at how much of your funnel or your process is done by the time a lead flows through there. You can close deals in you know weeks, if not days, mm -hmm. when they come more or less baked and someone's convinced themselves that they need your product mm -hmm. before they actually enter your pipeline. I don't think the SDR role should disappear entirely, but I think it needs to be drastically shrunk and changed. Mm -hmm. I'd argue that Right now, we have nearly a one-to-one -one or two-to-one setup across most orgs. That should look more like one to 10. Mm. Um, with an SDR picking up spillover and inbound leads, making sure that MQLs are done thoughtfully, and then engaging through the discovery process. And then they're tracked and comp differently. Mm -hmm. It takes a little more work, but let's stop talking about how many you did and how good they were instead. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, well, oh, man. look, we got in you know, five SQLs this week of those four were, were garbage. Yeah. I mean, that's the worst because now they've invested time and you've paid someone on leads that they converted, but they're bad. Mm -hmm. So you're getting nothing for it. Mm -hmm. I'd argue, let's go back, review the call and figure out how good that conversation was, then talk to the account exec and figure out how baked it was when it came through and have them do a back review of that lead because we have to trust somebody along the way and if we trust our AEs, then they can help us rate, rate and evaluate our SDRs. Mm -hmm. But if we can get them to get through the discovery call for inbound only, that means that our AEs need to do outreach and utilize personal lead flow to develop. So that LinkedIn work, all of that you know, personal brand work that they've done creates a flow in mm -hmm. and then leaves maybe 10% of their time for outbound. Mm -hmm. Why um, can't they do that? Why aren't, why aren't they doing that today? Honestly, I don't think we've taught people enough as to what that process looks like. I don't think people own their brand. I don't think people recognize that they have a brand. I'd argue, I mean. Do you think they, rec they don't recognize that it's important, <laughs> that things have changed, that they need to do this? I think it's a combo. I don't think they recognize it's important and I don't think they recognize what it is. Mm. I think people still look at LinkedIn as your online resume. The excuse that I hear a lot <clears throat> is I don't have time. Yeah, that's a big one. That's but, what I hear. You know, I don't think from, people from account executives. I had too many demos. Yeah, and then you go and look, you go and audit their performance, and they were sixty percent to quota. And oh, you don't have time to spend an hour a day on LinkedIn because you're doing demos that are going to close at one percent. Right. But and and you're behind quota, and you don't think that maybe you should change your behavior. Yeah. Well, and you bring up a good point, right? Change your behavior. We don't train people on behavior. We train people on process. And behavior is the underpinning to everything. If we don't teach people to do things differently and the baseline skills that build up to actually execute in a sales role, we're hiring people who can do things, but poorly. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the same, this in my mind is the same thing as like a good onboarding plan, right? We bring people in and we just tend to say, you know how to sell, here's our product, go read the product book, I'll show you our tools, get going. And they basically take six months to ramp up. Mm -hmm. Well, why is that? We haven't actually taught them how to sell. Mm -hmm. We haven't given them any real experience. We haven't taught them what makes for great. Mm -hmm. You know, in my mind, let's teach people what excellence means. Mm -hmm. Let's tell people how to operate at maximum capacity and set an expectation that that's what we're looking for. I mean, frankly, let's build an interview process that looks for that, that looks for behavior, not for, you know, day-to-day -day tactical movement. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, 
some people just treat you know Salesforce as their as their process. Mm-hmm. Um, so my argument would be from the ground up, we've got to dismantle across sales landscapes this attitude of I've got process and I have talk tracks I'm good, and build people back up again with the baseline behaviors toward greatness, so that they know what makes for a good salesperson, and so that they know and understand what we expect from them daily. I want to go back to one thing that you said that I think is super interesting both mm-hmm. in sales and in marketing and they kind of just drive together, which is let's start measuring how good they were, not how many of them they were. Mm-hmm. And so I'll go in and I'll audit mainly software companies and they'll be celebrating that they got 100,000 MQLs last year. And then when you actually track the progression of all those MQLs, they closed 148 deals. Right. And that is not a, given the amount of money you must spend to get those 100,000 to close 148, and then you look at it from a CAC standpoint, it is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the hard cost, it's not good. But then look at all the soft costs that are hidden. Mm -hmm. You have 100,000 MQLs. How many SDRs do you need in order to follow up with all those people? What if those SDRs were doing something else? What if you took those resources and did something else? And then all the leads that managed to get through the SDR process, and then they go to AEs, and then they close at a very low rate. How much hidden costs are involved in that, and opportunity costs and lost time? Mm-hmm. People, people do not recognize the hidden costs in business because what they end up doing because of the inefficiencies in the revenue model is they need so many more salespeople to support that, which then takes away from doing, a, and then over time as you build up that engine, you get very stuck. Mm -hmm. And we kind of alluded to behavior change and organizational change at the beginning. Um, But let's go through that in a little bit more, in a a lot more detail here, which is like, why is it such a, I mean, why do you think it's such a struggle to make those shifts? So I've actually been inside of companies, whether, I, I mean, as an employee and as a consultant, trying to push for changes like this. Mm -hmm. Having a marketing engine running that's generating 35% of pipeline and 30% of revenue. And instead of reinvesting more in marketing to continue to drive that, they go and hire 10 more SDRs and 10 more account executives. Companies that just literally do not recognize how things have changed and they continue to run a play that was built in 2001. Right. And so why, you know, why is that happening? I mean, there's a lot of different, a lot of different hypotheses. Why do you think it's happening? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of things in there, right? And the first I'd argue is that companies are insular. People look at their firm, they look at what's working, they know that they're getting something out of it, and they don't necessarily recognize what's happening out in the world. The best-in-class sales leaders are constantly looking outside and making small tweaks to try and drive things forward, then make holistic change and they get to a point to where they've you know, basically identified, okay, we've maxed out this program, even with all these tweaks. To your point, you made an analogy of building you know, building a house or building an office, at some point you can't just keep adding onto it. You tear it down, you build up, or you redesign, rebuild, and then shift. Mm-hmm. Um, but companies are insular and they often don't rebuild. They just keep adding trailers on and, and the cost goes up. And it's incredibly expensive if you have the 10-story building over here yeah. to simultaneously go build the 25-story building over here while you're still running this one. It is. It is, and it's also a knowledge thing, right? You never say to a sales leader, okay, you're working in this building, I need you to go build the new one while operating. It's just not feasible. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's why we do what we do, because at the end of the day, work with people who can help you do it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the realism for me is that, the, you know, there's, there's the other piece that, that really drives a lot of this behavior. People just don't feel comfortable doing it. Mm-hmm. You know, change is scary, mm-hmm. and it's hard. And when you get someone on the outside trying to recommend new things and do things in a different way, people, I don't want to say revolt, but they reject the notion that they're doing things not perfect. Yeah. And then you're you know, you're afraid of attrition, you're afraid of deal loss, you're afraid of things slipping through the cracks, you're afraid of missing something because people don't know process. Mm-hmm. My argument is always, you're going to see a dip before you see a rise. Sure. Right? You're changing process, there's always a break while people learn the new system. But you can mitigate it, you know, test it out, see how it works, roll over in small doses. Mm-hmm. It takes effort. Um, but I think the big thing are, are, you know, is twofold. As I said, it's, it's, it's fear and it's because we're too insular to really see on the outside. Mm-hmm. You combine the two and it basically creates a response of why would I do this? Yeah. 
So what is the, what's the risk? Like, um, we're telling all these people that they should change, but if you go into their business, like things are looking pretty good. That company grew, mm -hmm. they had 100,000 100, MQLs and wasted a fuck ton of money on them last year. Um, they're doing pretty good. They grew at 25%. It's good. What's the risk? Like what, what is, uh, what's in it for them? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things, right? People look at what's happening today and then they like to say, we're in great shape, we don't need to change, but they don't look at where the market's moving tomorrow. Um, and if you're not completely up to date with the most recent trends, you're gonna miss something. So yeah, great, you're fine right now, you're doing pretty well right now, but what about when the entire industry flips? People don't pay attention to efficiency. And when you know you have consistency over time and you're not making tweaks to drive efficiency upward, or you're not making these big changes to future proof yourself, your efficiency comparatively goes down. Mm -hmm. You know, you might be closing a lot today and having 25% year over year growth, that's great. Maybe in two years you should be at 75% year over year growth. That's what I'm saying. Um, and if frankly, in my opinion, if your MQL to deal close rate is 0.1%, which is basically a hundred out of a hundred thousand closed, you're doing something really wrong and you need to self-evaluate. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to tell people that in a way that's comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for people to look at themselves and say, hey man, I screwed up here. I need to fix this. Mm -hmm. Because then their VP says exactly that. Well, why? We're good enough. Yeah, well the reason is because the, the 100,000 MQLs are coming from trade show banner sc right. badge scans, um, ebook downloads for top of funnel stuff that has nothing to do with the product, right. um, webinars, syndicated content junk leads like that's that's why the percentage is slow because the right. activities are wrong that's wrong it's right. Uh, totally i would argue that right now given the incredible economic prosperity that's been happening over the past decade that the horrible inefficiencies inside of businesses have been hidden mm -hmm. they've been hidden right now and they will eventually become exposed when we have a slowdown when companies have to go in and audit. Do I really need that $10,000 a month SaaS tool that helps me send chocolates to my customers? Mm -hmm. Do I really need that when I'm doing prospecting? Do I really need those extra 10 SDRs? A lot of stuff will change yeah. when they're forced to make decisions, but right now they're not. Yeah, and the baseline is low right now, right? Like. There's so much growth, to your point, in, in anything that's hidden, there's still so much growth that everyone's comfortable. Mm -hmm. But once that's exposed and growth starts to stall or we recognize how fast we should be growing, mm -hmm. we're, gonna, we're either gonna be forced to change behaviors or people are gonna start losing it'll, their jobs. It'll be probably too late. Yeah. 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 So, where do we go from here? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I think there's a huge mind shift that needs to take place across the entire industry. If it were up to me, I would kind of take a serious look at how we're sitting and start to break things down much further than we have. You know, I, I, we've alluded to this a couple of times, behavior-driven selling is more important than ever. Utilizing your, um, your personal brand and your own social network is becoming more and more important for you know, forward-looking lead, lead generation and, and um, you know, just company presence, corporate presence. And we're reaching a point to where how we track and hold accountable our staff is gonna make massive moves in the future because we're, we've been just really numerical and data, not data-driven, um, well, data, financially data-driven. Yeah, too, too much math and process. Absolutely. And not enough trusting our people to get things done. Mm -hmm. And, and to not have, enough buyer focus. Yeah, I mean, everything is about our buyer. Yeah. You know, and it should be. It should be, but it's not. Yeah. You know, but again, it's there's a difference between what we want to teach our people and what we're being asked to teach people mm -hmm. versus what companies are holding people accountable for. If we're if you're gonna bring a company in to teach, you know, discovery process and modern deal flow, and then you hold them accountable to how many SQLs they close at a minimum number scape over the last two months, there's a mismatch. Mm -hmm. Because we're just it's all about qualification, not about really getting deep in a client. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, last topic. Yeah. Um, so we talked outside about having a long-term mindset. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the things that I mentioned that I strongly believe in, not because it's a theory, but because I experience it, is that when you, if you can actually get over and think long term, and a lot of people pretend, a lot of people convince themselves that they're thinking long term when they're not, but if you can actually get over it, then your behavior completely changes and you actually get better results in the short term as well. Yep. I'm living it right now. Um, I can confidently say that I have never made a LinkedIn post or put out any piece of content thinking I need to generate one lead from this. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to sell something. Everything is about putting out information with the idea that if people get value from it, it builds brand and long-term brand equity, yep. which will then come back to you later. Um, I have the luxury of not having investors or other financial things, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me if we close six deals this month or five. Mm -hmm. um, for other companies, they put themselves in a position where they are forced to met, be focused on the short term. So what do you, um, like, what are you seeing right now globally, or is, is there anyone that's doing it really well from a company standpoint, right? Like, we're, we're an SMB. Mm -hmm. From like a company standpoint that's able to take that long-term mindset and actually implement it. Yeah, and, and I don't want to call out any names here, right? Yeah, of but, course. But, you know, we've, we've started to see, um, what I think is really interesting is when companies start to take that step back and really look at and evaluate what matters to them from a cultural perspective. And I think when you can look at what you want to be as a company, not only do your behaviors start to change, but how you look at, at your clients starts to shift and your partners and your, and your prospects start to shift. And I'd argue that the more you decide you care about your customers, the more the things that you're encouraging people to do shift and tie back to being those value-driven thought leaders and putting information out in the world, assuming that you know, it's just information mm -hmm. and it's valuable to other people so you'll share it. The irony is that by sharing free stuff, people see that you get it mm -hmm. and they start discourse and they want to engage and they see what you're doing and they get your value. Mm -hmm. If you start to put that out in the world, you know, your credibility skyrockets and yeah. people want to work with you and that drives those relationships that we rely so hard on because you're helping people figure things out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's amazing, but people love people who help them solve issues and who are thoughtful and engaged. Yeah. Which then creates a product consideration to buy whatever you're doing. So Jake and, I, Jake and I are on the same page with this. I'm not hiding any of my information for a forum. Right. I am not hiding in any information so someone calls me for a consultation and then I give them the real information. I'm giving them the information. Right. Like if they actually had the ability to consume it, completely change the way they think about it, they wouldn't have to pay me any money. They could go and implement it themselves. The problem is that nobody's actually going to do that. Yeah, I'd, I'd argue that 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 you know, just watching what Jake does online. I mean, he just wants people to learn. Yeah. And I, and I think that's a brilliant strategy because if you want people to learn, they digest it, but they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And that's when you start getting engagement. You know, and, and across most of what I've started to see on LinkedIn, no one's talking product. And one of the first things I always tell people when I meet with them is no one cares about your product. Stop talking about it. Zero. Um, and usually that's that like eye-opening moment of, oh, yeah. what do you mean? And we start getting into the weeds and details. But it's the, you know, it's the insights and the thought process that then has to tie back to a greater strategy. And I think that's where most folks don't know what to do with what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. How do you take these nuggets and make something world class out of it? Um, and that's where people really need support and help. Uh, I'd argue that today, you know, we're starting to see this shift again, and we've talked about this a little bit, away from you know process and and you know the the bits and pieces into this greater. How do I create a long term strategy that sticks for me through the phase that I'm in? But I think where people are going to need help in the future is getting over the phase humps. You know, I've now gone through this period of growth. Mm -hmm. We're transitioning into another period. How do we get through it? Mm -hmm. And to me, this is the piece that means long term. Um, and you need to think about this two years before you get there, three years before you get there. How do I transition stage? 
Uh, and I think that's where we're going to start to see people businesses really spike again. Uh, because, you know, like, like investors want to see all this growth, but at the same time, they also want to see stability. And creating a place and a platform where, you know, literally think about it like a train, right? You don't want to have to drive your train all the way around uh, a mountain. You just want to build a bridge so that you can cross it quickly and easily and comfortably. So we're going to become more and more, as people businesses, those bridges to get us across from stage, from our current to our future state. Um, but, you know, I also think, and then I'll, I'll kind of end this here, yeah. that creating those partnerships that can help you cross those bridges is more important than ever. Because again, we're no longer selling product, we're selling you know, a, a, a problem solved and we're trying to be consultants. Um, so people in any industry at any org are probably more important than they've ever been before. Uh, and that's not gonna change anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, I think uh, just to, to close, and I think you'll, you'll certainly agree with this, the people at the companies are good people. They can do the things, they need the strategy. Yeah. And they need someone to show them how to do it. It's a good way to close. That's great.